Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV. The main talking points on tonight's programme. Football has lost one of its all-time greats as Johan Cruyff passes away at the age of 68. The Champions League could be in line for a revamp in the next couple of seasons. We'll look ahead to Czech Republic against Scotland and we'll hear from Lee Wallace, the Rangers fullback, on not being selected for his country. Just a few of the stories we'll be discussing tonight. Alan Ruff is alongside me, Peter Martin. Delighted we have journalist Mark Guidi with us to discuss all the headlines. Um, well, right now, <coughs> I think it's a sad day for football. He's one of the all-time Time legends, certainly for me growing up as a boy, Ruffy, uh, you as a player um, must have been in awe of Johan Cruyff. Yep, the uh, ability was there for everybody to, to see. He was a kind of idol that uh, young young kids growing up, you know, that I think I think really he was the first one with a trick that I can remember, you know, and, uh, and everybody tried to copy it, but uh, for even club level and international level, he was an absolutely wonderful player. Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you know you're a star, Mark, when you've got a, a, a trick named after you, the Cruyff turn, every kid wanted to do it in the 70s. And you look through his career as, as well, Peter, Ajax, Barcelona, Holland, Ballon d'Ors, you know, he, he was a, a genius. And I've heard it being said today that perhaps a, the best European player of all time, and, uh, you know, that, that's probably accurate. Yeah, in, in a strange sort of way, Ruffy, I, I can remember at the time, because everyone had talked about Pele as the greatest <coughs> ever player, um, in a sense, in Europe, we were kind mm -hmm. of uh, championing Johan Cruyff as somebody that could, you know, live alongside him. You were almost looking for him mm -hmm. as the hero for our continent. Yeah, I, I think, uh, and I've said this on numerous occasions, when you start uh, talking about world class, for me, uh, I, I judge it on when you grab a, a, a big tournament and, and you are the star. You know, you you make it your tournament, and certainly he was in enough tournaments that he starred. Uh, so I would have him up there with the rest of them. Yeah, uh, is he top five for you, the yeah, world's biggest players? Yeah, I think he is. Yeah, I think he's, he, he's a wonderful player. Uh, and, and, and at Barcelona, you know, you look at the games that he played in, it was single-handed, the goals he was scoring. You know, it was something a wee bit different style of player than Messi, but he, he was winning games single-handedly. Yeah, and the other thing about it, two <coughs> things I want to talk about on that point with him and reflecting on uh, what a genius he was on the park, Mark, uh, uh, is the fact that, uh, you know, he had uh, so much skill um, as a player, <coughs> but as a manager, he was also a leader as well, yeah. especially with the dream team of 92. But he, he seemed to have the whole structure of Barcelona and the way it, the way it continues today was all about Cruyff and his, his ethos. It was. He put the foundations in place, Peter, and the building blocks gradually uh, came. A big influence on, on Guardiola and, and people before him and uh, the hierarchy at the new camp always <coughs> went to him. Uh, for guidance and advice, the same at, uh, at Ajax, um, eight nine years ago when the club you know started to slip a wee bit, they went to him and he went in as a technical um, advisor. So a clever, clever man and the kind of guy that obviously when he said something, you, you listened and 99 times out of 100, he was right. Yeah, and, and the other thing, Ruffy, I remember as a boy, you, you couldn't get an Ajax top. It's not as mm -hmm. if you could just nip <coughs> into a sports shop now and buy any top. It was one of those iconic jerseys that I, I desperately wanted to have at that time. You, you couldn't get them in the 70s. Certainly couldn't get them if you were in as big a family as I was. <laughs> yeah, and, he, and, he, and he actually made that jersey, you know, it was just... Uh, uh, at that particular time, that era, they were just fantastic. You know, the, the style of football they played. I have to say on a personal note, I played against Holland twice and uh, he, he never managed to score by me. Yeah. Was he not played? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I knew right away there, but there had to be some technical issue as to why Cruyff never scored because we've had about 700 guests on here and they've all scored against him. Van, Van der Kerkhoff got a hat trick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he will be uh, undoubtedly sadly missed. I think uh, when you see some of the tributes <clears throat> coming out from, uh, you know, some of the players uh, and, of course, the football clubs that he touched. I mean, amazingly, um, at the tail end of his career as well, he was able to go back to the likes of Feyenoord and win uh, the Eredivisie with uh, Feyenoord as well. At the latter stages of his career, he was still able to produce the goods. Yeah, he was influential. Um and uh, it'll be a big loss, you know, he was a great guiding light um, in Dutch football as well, going right back to Venus Mikels and, and, and right through uh, the stages. So, yeah, he is, a, he is a loss and you can just see with the, 
the outpouring of grief and the tributes that's coming, you know, how, how such high esteem he was held. Yeah, and, and the one regret, I think, Ruffy, for me, is that Holland never won the World Cup in 1974. No disrespect to West Germany. No, but the, the, there were a lot of good sides about then. Uh, they gave it a good uh, shot. I thought that game could have went either way. Uh, and at that particular time, though, Dutch football were just coming into that total football era. And uh, I, I think everybody was hoping that they would win that year. Yeah, OK. Um, Johan Cruyff, and uh, <coughs> we will have a little tribute to the great man at the end of this programme. Let's switch our attention to uh, a stage where Johan Cruyff was ultimately at ease, European football. Um, he won the European Cup on three occasions with Ajax in uh, the 70s, 71, 72, 73. And I would suggest to you that uh, if the Champions League gets the revamp that has been suggested, teams like Ajax w might struggle to get into it in, in the new format if it gets the go-ahead in a couple of seasons, Mark Greedy. Well, Dr. Peter, if you're going to have the big nations, Germany, Spain, <coughs> England, Italy... France, we were just off that as well, then if they're still going to get the chance to get the four club teams in, then you could have your 16 teams made up the four of them, so that's not good for the game, it's not healthy, if they're going to put them all into a pot, I mean, I, the format I'd like for the Champions League currently with the 32 teams, once you get past all the qualifiers, is I'd have eight seeded teams, you know, your main eight clubs, one from every nation, and then put the other 24 in a pot. And if you get drawn with somebody from your own country, so be it. But it opens it up, makes it a bit fairer. But clearly they're not going to go for that. But if this comes off, the last 32 then becomes a knockout and the 16 winners come together and it's two leagues of eight to carry right through November, December, January, February, March. Then if we take clubs in our own country, Celtic, the past few years, if Rangers get back in to join them, you know, we are going to be very, very fortunate to get into that last 16 stage. I mean, it's another step. Uh, of a knockout stage and um, I think it would be near than possible for us to get into it now. Yeah, I, I, as I mentioned to you a couple of weeks back on the programme, Ruffy, nothing happens without a reason <coughs> behind it and I, I, I could smell something coming from the statements from Karl Heinz Rummenigge and others uh, looking at the English Premiership deal and clearly thinking, well, it's all about the rich getting them even stronger, giving them even more money, bridging the gap between Europeans, top clubs and the money that the, the Premier League in England will earn. And it will be a table of greed and everybody else gets the scraps. And that's the way it's panning out here. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, I mean, you've <clears throat> described it as it is and, and, and what, is, it was, what they're all trying to do. But I think if, if it's teams like Celtic, you know, have to start doing something if they want to be in the mix. If they are going to push it through, I hope they don't push it through, but it means that these kind of clubs, the Ajax is Celtic, and that would have to change their way uh, of what they're doing at their own club just now, the, the downsizing bit they would have to start spending again, which remains to be seen whether they can or not. In a strange way, Mark, if they don't <coughs> uh, you know, get some sort of change, again, it's almost as if the rich clubs are holding a gun to UEFA to say, if you don't do it, we're breaking away. I think change will come, Peter, because you know, UEFA are a wee bit vulnerable just now. There'll be a new uh, chief going in there. So I think that's an, and Alan's point in terms of if we take Celtic, will they go and spend to try and get to that last 16 um, stage? Well, phrases that, that owners and chief executives hate is speculate to accumulate, and that's what you'd have to do. Yeah. And for me, it, it, it's too big a risk. You know, I just think, you know, and you know, you, you look at clubs like Man City, you know, up until this season, they, they weren't even getting out of the group stages, and they were spending 200 million quid a summer. So there's no guarantees, but it just makes it harder and harder for Scottish teams to get into it, and you're almost getting close to the stage where you're, you're pretty much kissing goodbye to the Champions League. Yeah, I, I don't know what uh, Celtic can fight this with. I don't know what Ajax and other teams, <coughs> lesser teams that have a great European pedigree, um, Ruffy, I don't know how they battle with this one because clearly the Europa League is not going to satisfy everyone. You know, I think that's why they're all, as we speak, you know, having meetings and having discussions, you know, getting together and working up some kind of plan that could probably uh, defeat the one that they're trying to push through. So we'll just have to wait and see how much clout that they've got. 
Yep. Okay. Um, we uh, will undoubtedly talk more <coughs> about this on the program as the weeks and months progress. Coming up in the next part of the program, uh, we'll talk Scotland. They are taking on the Czech Republic. Gordon Strachan uh, will uh, obviously want a good test for the Scotland side. We'll uh, discuss Darren Fletcher's comments. He thinks the squad will be good enough to qualify. Uh, to the next major tournament, the World Cup, and we'll hear from Lee Wallace, who's been talking about not being selected for his country. Uh, just a few of the things we'll be discussing in the next part of the programme here on Peter and Ruffy's Football Show. Alan Ruff is alongside me, Peter Martin. Our boot room guest is Mark Guidi. Join us after the break if you can. Welcome back to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show. Alan Ruff is alongside me, Peter Martin. Our boot room guest is the football journalist Mark Guidi uh, joining us on tonight's programme. Of course, uh, we've got the friendlies coming up. Gordon Strachan has mentioned, Ruffy, that uh, he could have taken easier friendlies, but Czech Republic, Denmark, Italy, France will give him uh, a good indication of whether some of the players that he's introducing can mm -hmm. uh, hack it at this level. Yeah, I, th I think it's always good when you play... Uh, <coughs> A team that you're going to be tested at. There's no point in playing somebody and winning four and five nothing and then going into a really difficult game. So yep, he'll be hoping that the players that he's brought along there that uh, he'll know most of them what they can do. Uh, he'll be maybe looking at just one one person just jumping out and uh, adding to his squad that he can bring in and add something to that team. Yeah, I think we were chatting about it on yesterday's program, Mark, and established with Alec Ray that you know if Gordon Strachan gets two, maybe three that have forced their way into his mind. Um, he'll be happy. You know, Peter, I, I think we're, we're fairly well off for strikers, for midfielders, for fullbacks. <coughs> um, but I think for us to have a serious chance of qualifying for the World Cup in 2018, and I'm not talking about winning the group, I think England will win the group, but yeah. to get that second place, we have to find a central defensive partnership. Um, and I don't know where they are, I don't know who it is, that's up to Gordon Strachan, but uh, we don't keep enough clean sheets, we can see too many goals. Um, and that's something that has to be addressed. If we can find a solid central defensive partnership, if it's somebody, two players already within the squad, or somebody emerges over the next six months, then great. But without that, I think we're doomed. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because we can't think of anybody, Ruffy. And it's no disrespect, again, to uh, Gordon Greer, Grant Hanley, who, uh, again, sometimes Charlie Mulgrew has mm -hmm. to go in there. Uh, these guys are the here and now. I think, unfortunately, we're looking at the type of centre half that we used to have, yeah. commanding, physical presence, defending uh, you know, at the back end and offering a threat in the front end and we don't have that. No and also as well I think the modern day uh, centre, -half, centre half has to have some kind of ability with the ball at his feet as well. If you look at all the top teams they're all comfortable in the ball, they all build up for the back, you know, our two guys unfortunately aren't like that at all, they're just 100% players who go out and win the ball and, and do their best. But the, you're right, there's nobody out there, so you can't blame Gordon for that. I'm sure all everybody uh, in all the leagues will be scouring, looking for somebody to come out. But I can't see anybody in these two squads jumping out and saying, oh, that's the one. Yeah, maybe sometimes, and I think football can be cruel, the perception and the reality, but, you know, the Czech Republic team have been speaking ahead of this and a number of them are saying that, you know, Scotland are a different type of team now. They try and pass it. There's a lot more passing, a lot more emphasis on the technical ability and working hard when you don't have the ball. Uh, whereas they always thought British teams have that kind of a more route one approach and, and physical uh, in you know decades gone by. Uh, I wonder if it's to our detriment. Well, I, I like the style that we play just now, Peter. I think it suits us because you've got Anya's, <coughs> Maloney's, Naismith's, boy, that sort you know, I like that. And like I say, I think we're well off for strikers, whether it's Tony Watt tonight or Ross McCormack. You've then got Lee Griffiths or Chris Martin uh, on Tuesday night at Hamden against Denmark. You've got Jordan Rhodes not even in the squad. Stephen Fletcher's um, ill um, just now. So I think we're well off. Um, and I like the style that Gordon Strachan um, has, has adopted in the past two years. It's good on the eye. But like I say, just to go back to the, to the point, if you look at what it takes to qualify <laughs> from a section, you've got to win... 90% of your, your home game. So for us to have any chance, you've got to win your four games and take a draw from England. So 13 points minimum is your, from the home games, your starting point, and you, you've then got to nick five or six away from home in whatever manner. If you can't do that, you don't qualify. We've not managed to do that for the past eight qualification campaigns. And I think Euro 2016 was our best chance to get there. I don't want to get into this campaign on a downer, yeah. but... Um, 
I don't think we're going to do it. Yeah, I, I think the only area where we are well off, Ruffy, is the midfield area. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I take what you're talking about. We do have a, an amount of players in the striking area that we've got a lot of mm -hmm. choice, but I don't think we've got the quality. That's a strange thing about it. I don't think there's the ability to snatch a goal, you know, when mm -hmm. the team's not playing well, somebody with that lethal, uh, you know, striking prowess. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, the, the, the other worrying thing for me is that Gordon's already come out and said we're lightweight. You know, we're a small midfield. It uh, was already touched on how, how small these players are. And he always says, oh, some, some games we go into, we just get muscled out of it. You know, that's something maybe he has to look at as well. But certainly there are people out there who can win a game for you. I, I would just like to see us, particularly at home, just being that wee bit more ambitious, you know, and, and getting out and trying to win games comfortably. Yeah, and, and I feel sorry for the likes of Darren Fletcher. He's a brilliant lad, 32 years of age, and like so many, Ruff, he hasn't sampled a World Cup. Yeah, and, and again, it, he'll be a main player for us, but I would like to think that if he is going to be the main player, he's going to have people run about him, you know, that he can bring into the game. You know, we I think if you can give him a role of controlling the game, he'll do that at his age. Uh, we just need the right people. Uh, players around about. Yep, uh, as far as players who have not been selected, you mentioned uh, Jordan Rhodes. One of the other names that was put forward was Lee Wallace. He's been speaking ahead of Rangers' match against Queen of the South uh, about not being included in Gordon Strachan's squad. Whether it's been unlucky or not, I, th <clears throat> I mean, there's the true relevance to me talking about teams and players has to be here. It has to lie at Rangers, and I think. We can get caught up in, in, in all this stuff. I mean, the, the squad's been announced. The game's tonight. There's another game next week. Let's just let's just go on with it. That's that's the way I think. I'm not going to be disappointed or lose sleep over not being included in the squad. And I'm not going to spend too much time thinking about if I can get in a squad in, in years to come. I think the main focus and my main ambitions are to do as well as I can for Rangers and ensure that we can be the best possible team. Or I can be the best possible player every time I put on a Rangers strip. Do you have a certain amount of sympathy with them, Mark? Lee Wallace, yeah, I, I do. You know, he's clearly put put Rangers first um, over the past four or five years, and have a lot of admiration for him because he, he knew he was going to sacrifice his Scotland international career. But all is not lost for Lee Wallace. It's all about who starts the season well, Peter. As we know, middle yeah. of July the League Cup's <coughs> going to start, so you're going to have six weeks before Gordon Strachan names his squad for the double header, um, the opening two games, uh, is it Lithuania and Slovakia. I think it might be our first two games. Um, so he's got a chance, but a stiff competition from young Tierney at Celtic to Andy Robertson to Stephen Whitaker, Graham Shinney, Lee Wallace, you know, so there's a lot um, there, but certainly Wallace has the ability to be in the squad, but he's still got a right good chance of getting in there. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, um, <coughs> talking ahead of Rangers against uh, Queen of the South at the weekend, we're on air two o'clock on Saturday afternoon, Ruffy. Uh, and it's just countdown now to Rangers get over the line with the title. Yeah, as they'll be they'll be taking the Falkirk uh, game just as a small hiccup, you know. Seemingly the first forty five minutes <coughs> were absolutely magnificent. Uh, mm. Second forty five, they're still scratching their heads to see how that happened. But these things happen in football. Yep, uh, I think they'll be ready planning for next year and. Uh, the game at the weekend will just be another one to get nearer it. Yeah, and uh, uh, the fallout from that uh, in the dressing room afterwards, no surprise, they had a rami about it, you know, and what, what has gone wrong, that's what teams do. Yeah, but listen, words have, have been exchanged. Uh, Mark Warburton said that uh, after the game. You just sense now they want to get it over the line as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, you're right, Peter, you, know, you probably expect me to have it wrapped up in the next couple of weeks. It then becomes about Hibs or Falkirk. That's the, the issue now in that division and uh, you know credit to Alan Stubbs but really fantastic piece of work from Peter Houston and his squad there because I've just come up you know slowly uh, and quietly and they uh, caught everybody by surprise. Yeah uh, are they finishing second for you or is it still Hibs for you Ruffy? No, I think they might now I think uh, Hibs have had a, in the last month have had some big big games the players have had to react to them they've still got big games coming up I just think catch up at this st start of the season is not what you want to be doing. OK, uh, thanks uh, to Ruffy uh, and also thanks to uh, Mark Guidi. In the next couple of weeks, we'll get Mark's thoughts on uh, the awards ceremonies. Uh, and I know Mark uh, on the programme will highlight that his awards is the best ceremony ever uh, for the football <laughs> writers. That's still to come, folks. Um, but uh, we'll have that argument on another day. Today, even with football writers up and down the country and players and managers alike, we're mourning the passing of a legend. Johan Cruyff, rest in peace.